Let's do a little bit more with special relativity. I'm going to start off with space-time interval. Now, like this daily savings time is like time travel. Uh, so we'll look at space-time intervals. It's something very, very quick to talk about, although there's a lot to it. But um, here's the idea, is that um, Einstein, he looked at something, he looked at space, which is, you know, x, y, z coordinates, and time. And he said, ah, he made it a four-dimensional construct. So in other words, it's space and time, so they called it space-time. Oddly enough. So in other words, there's an X, Y, Z, and T. So it's actually four dimensions. And it turns out like one observer's uh, opinion about, uh, you know, what there is around them is going to differ from another observer who is, you know, in X primed and Y primed and Z primed and T primed. And this is how you can get from one to the other in a nice way here. This is, it's a little bit weird seeming, okay? It's a lot of times in relativity, it helps to have uh, time as not an actual time, but as c times t. In other words, the speed of light times time, which makes it a little bit weird. Like, why would we do a velocity times a time? Um, it's related to this idea that, for example, you know how you have like velocity as distance over time, but if you have speed of light, it's c equals d over t, right? But then if you want to know sort of a, a distance, a distance is just going to be c times t. So it's like, you can imagine, it's like a distance in time is a weird way of saying it but this is why we can do this so it's like it's like a distance in time here this is like a distance within time you're often going to see ct together so don't get thrown off if you see that okay this is just going to be a common little thing we do to make it easier and this right here is um, this whole thing is called a space-time interval it's how you can get from different reference frames right from t primed and x primed over to t and x but what's interesting is this quantity right here, the ct squared minus x squared, it's actually something called an invariant interval. That's actually what it's called here. It turns out that piece right there is constant. And that's something really interesting. Uh, sadly, we don't get to go into so much detail with it within uh, this actual option, but this becomes really important in sort of hardcore relativity classes. But something like this, we can just uh, skip it for now, or at least just talk about this piece. We're going to use it a little bit later on in another example I'll show you. But let's talk about muon decay now. So if you remember what uh, muons are from uh, particle physics, a muon is this symbol mu here. Remember that's one of the leptons, you know, from particle physics? I like this, physics at the farm, discovery of the muon, get it? Because he's saying probably mu, so it's like a muon. So uh, muons, they're made in particle accelerators, um, but actually they're also made just in the upper atmosphere naturally. So what happens is some cosmic rays will come in and they'll slam into something in the atmosphere here and make this little uh, muon. Uh, whoops, it won't be that. It'll be a solid line, won't it, if we're doing particle physics here. So some sort of uh, particle like this will be a muon. So these happen around 10 kilometers up high here. They're around 10 kilometers up where this, where this event can happen. These muons can be created. Here's the issue. The muons, they go at a rough speed of about 0.98 the speed of light. So they go 98% the speed of light. So pretty fast, obviously. And like I said, they're formed 10 kilometers high. Here's the problem in a sense. The average lifetime, like if you're sort of in the lab, if you're stopping a muon just to measure it, the average lifetime of a muon is only 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. In other words, uh, whoops, I should say, so it's 2.2, .2, let's say, uh, here. microseconds, here we go. So Remember, that's what a mu is. A mu is actually a micro. Right? It's 10 to the minus 6. So 10 to the minus 6 is a microsecond. So these things are very short-lived. Turns out if you do the math for it, again, you know, you have velocity is distance over time. So if you want to find out then the distance it should travel, distance is velocity times time. If its velocity is 0 0.98 times the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8, times uh, time, which is 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Actually, do this on your calculator. So 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 6 times 3 times 10 to the 8 times 0.98. I end up with 646. So that's pretty much 650 meters. So here's the issue then. If you weren't considering relativity at all, if you just considered this as it is, a muon you know, should only have a lifetime of 2.2 my um, uh, microseconds and it should only be able to travel a distance of 650 meters there's no way it can get to that 10 kilometers do you see that 650 meters clearly not enough so it shouldn't be detected on earth 
However, we do detect them on Earth. Now, I want to point out something uh, not many people talk about. It, but I think it's an important little distinction. We're talking about the average lifetime. Some of them can actually live longer. Some live less long. So what ends up happening is if you account for relativity, so you can do all the details of it. Um, I don't think the IB needs you to go quite into detail, but I did it with my class. We just went through the calculations. Um, so you can actually figure out, well, then how how can they actually be detected? Because we really do find them on Earth. Sometimes we can actually detect them from there. We shouldn't have. They shouldn't be alive, so to speak. Not alive, but they shouldn't be able to reach our detectors because they should have only gotten 650 meters and then sort of disappeared and become maybe something else. So we shouldn't have been able to detect them. So how could we have? Well, one way is you could say uh, time dilation happened. In other words, um, if we're looking at it, that little uh, muon, which it thinks it lives 2.2 microseconds, remember this whole effect about time difference, right? So on Earth, then what happens with, due to these relativistic effects, you can actually account for relativity and this speed and find gamma. Um, I did it all, actually. What did I get? Um, I ended up that um, on Earth, then we should actually think that they last 11 microseconds instead of 2.2. So you see, although the muon thinks it only lived 2.2 microseconds, we actually, because of relativity, we think it actually, uh, you know, it lives uh, 11 microseconds. So that's how it can get a lot closer. Now keep in mind, it actually takes it uh, 33 microseconds to get to Earth. So you think, well, if it's only living, you know, 11 microseconds, how come we can still detect it? Because it technically, it, you know, that still doesn't get you all the way there. But it turns out, yes, you will detect some of them because that was the average lifetime was 2.2. So some of them can actually make it. Basically, the idea is this. No matter how you look at it, time dilation ends up meaning that um, these things right here can be found on Earth. And because of that, we, uh, we know that there had to be relativistic effects here. If you do all the math and figure it out, it actually all works out great. You could also see it that uh, length is contracted. In other words, if you're the muon, it's like it's less distance you have to travel. That 10 kilometers becomes uh, less. I think, what is it? Uh, yeah, it's two kilometers. So that becomes only two kilometers if you're that muon. You're like, oh, that's great. So this is sort of how it works here. This relativistic effects here uh, become important. So I just wanted to point that out. So for the fact that we can detect muons on Earth tells us that relativistic effects are important. In fact, time dilation and length contraction, this is, this is evidence for them, so to speak. Uh, so I think that's really interesting, actually. So we know this happens. Uh, we're going to see some other examples, too. Um, you know, in HL, for example, we're going to talk about GPS. Uh, global positioning system and how we can actually know that general relativity exists, which is this effect that uh, gravity itself should actually cause a time difference. So these things sound really wacky and weird, and yet we really do see them happening. These are real. These have been detected for, well, more than 100 years now. These things have been known. So this really is how the universe works. Length really does get contracted. Time really does seem to be different depending on a reference frame, which is kind of mind-blowing.